So in her book, Traveling Mercies, the author Anne Lamott talks about why she makes her son Sam go to church. She writes this, the main reason is to give him what I have found in the world, which is to say a path and a little light to see by. Most of the people I know who have what I want, which is to say purpose, heart, balance, gratitude, joy, they are people in community who practice their faith. They are Buddhist, Jews, Christians, people banding together to work on themselves and for human rights. They follow a brighter light than the glimmer of their own candle. They are part of something beautiful. It sounds a lot like what we have here, doesn't it? A flock of beautiful souls doing our best, doing our best imperfectly, as I always say, doing our best to make sense of life, to care for one another, and to respond to the inequities in this world, locally and beyond. We freely come together as one congregation, united in love, with service as our prayer. Each week we affirm a covenant or a promise to one another. Love is the doctrine of this church. Go ahead, say it with me if you know it by heart, and allow yourself, if you don't, to just soak in the beauty of these words. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. We say those words each week, yet what do they mean? How do they guide us, help us make decisions, set priorities, or settle disputes? We have no creeds as Unitarian Universalists. A creed is a set of beliefs used in religious context, generally believed to have come from God. Love is our doctrine. A doctrine is a set of beliefs created by a person or a group of people that is used not only in religious contexts, but also by political parties, other civic groups, many other groups. A covenant is a promise made with free and mutual agreement. It is a living example of the democratic process, foundational to Unitarian Universalism, historically and in the present day. A covenant can be made between two people or a group of people. Covenant is often created by the same people who then agree to it. The word covenant has its origins from Latin, convenir, meaning to go with. Covenant is how those who have chosen to come together journey together. Living in covenant is a privilege and a responsibility. As Unitarians Universalists, we use covenant in all areas of our religious life. In addition to the congregation, we use it in small groups, including staff teams, between ministers, between congregations, and with our larger Unitarian Universalist Association. We also, as Julie mentioned, covenant to affirm and promote the seven principles of our faith listed on the back of your order of service and in the hymnals. Our mission and covenant are interdependent. Our mission, again, which you hear every week, come as you are, journey together in love, act with courage, transform our world, which is, by the way, within ourselves, between us and in the larger world. 
That mission explains why we are here. The covenant states how we will be together. The history of covenant in religious settings goes back to the Old Testament and Judaism. The first covenant being between Adonai, or God, and Noah, when after the flood, God promises the world will not be destroyed in that way again. The second covenant between Adonai and Abraham, the father of the Israelites, is when God reveals to Abraham that his seed will spawn a great nation. Circumcision in the Jewish tradition is a symbol of that covenant. The third great covenant was the revelation of God's many laws, including the Ten Commandments, to Moses on Mount Sinai. Covenant in Unitarian Universalism is horizontal rather than vertical, meaning it is a promise made between people who are accountable to one another. Such use of covenant is born out of the Cambridge Platform signed in 1648 by the newly forming churches in colonial America, which we just experienced. These churches were concerned with civil organization more than theology. They believed, and I quote, that the church should reflect the ethic of the larger society. And what they longed for was sincere religious association based in love and founded in freedom. 21 of the 65 congregations who voted to approve the Cambridge Platform in 1648 are Unitarian congregations today. This Cambridge platform outlined in detail how the newly organized churches would function in terms of leadership, ministry, membership, placing the authority clearly in the congregation and its members. Conrad Wright writes about this in his book, Walking Together. He says, what is the difference between a collection of religiously concerned individuals and a church? Covenants still serve their essential function, which is to make church out of a collection of individuals, to establish community. Though it may sound obsolete, the principles laid out in the Cambridge platform lay the foundation for our nation's founding and still influence religious and political thinking today. Much of this is good, though not all. Covenants have been used as weapons to ensure power over others most often to maintain the power of the dominant group. It is something for us to be aware of and sensitive to in our own workings and discernment. For example, we need to be aware of the cultural norms, recognizing the differences in how cultures deal with conflict, express affection, engage in worship. In addition to historic interests, covenants have real and lasting value in our day-to-day -day lives. They exist in marriages and other committed relationships, as well as groups we join. Co covenants create boundaries. They serve as tools for decision-making, and they provide inspiration over the long haul and during challenging times. They remind us that we are far more than ourselves alone, and of the necessity of balancing individual needs with those of the larger good, something we can too easily forget on our own. We become better people and often more intelligent, writes the Unitarian Universalist Association Commission on Appraisal. We become better people and often more intelligent when we make the intentional choice to create connections and stand in a collaborative community with one another. Carl Scovel, Minister Emeritus of Boston's King's Chapel, which is actually the oldest Unitarian church in the United States, describes covenant as a remedy in a world where self-interest has gone too far. Covenant has a remedy in a world where self-interest has gone too far at the expense of others and our earth. He says, we live in a world today of now and wow. He talks a lot about social media in that perspective. We get snippets that are now and wow with no context. 
no tradition. He says it is a world of shattered meaning. Covenant is what calls us back to the values we hold most important and the promises we make one another. Ministers Rebecca Parker and John Buren's write covenant because of its connection to hope. It's about a community's commitment to a vision without which we all perish. The issue of covenant was raised in our church last year, both as a point of clarification as we voted on our values and our mission and our ends, and also in relation to conflict that arose during our annual meeting. Hopefully it's become clearer that our newly adopted mission statement does not replace our long-held covenant. Rather, the mission statement guides us in how we actualize our covenant and our priorities, our ministries, and programs of the church. And so, too, can our covenant guide us in our relations with one another, including how we make space for differences of opinion and understand conflict as a source of creative tension and greater wisdom when held within the loving arms of our covenant. Our parish board will be holding discussion groups this fall, inviting us all to discuss our covenant, and I sincerely hope you will participate. As I move into the last bit, I want to speak to the role that covenant plays during liminal times, such as right now. Liminal times when what was is no longer and what will be has not yet become. When things are in transition, such as now, as we're emerging from the pandemic. During times like this, I ask you to reflect on yourself. I know it's true for me. During such times like this, we are at risk of exhaustion, loss of perspective, lack of hope, turning against ourselves and other people, looking for someone to blame. Our emotions are more on the surface, raw and variable day to day. One of the many, many benefits of church during such times is that we call each other to our better selves. And our covenant reminds us what we are for in this world, not just against. We feed our souls by being connected and choosing to be part of something larger than ourselves like this beloved congregation. And I'll close with words of, again, Reverend Rebecca Parker and John Buren's. They write, this is what we do in progressive religion in the midst of an economic system that increasingly treats humans as expendable dead wood, we insist on restoring heart wood. We offer a framework of covenantal commitment. We live by shared hope. We make a path by walking it, not alone, together. And we pray that along the way, those who walk with us will be converted and will make a deep personal commitment to its radical form of hope, not for themselves alone, but for everyone. Amen and blessed be.